Hello, uh, good afternoon, and uh, welcome back again to the uh, Pineland Speaker Series. Uh, today, we're very fortunate to have with us uh, Mike Van Cleff. He's, uh, I believe, the director of the New Jersey Invasive uh, Species Strike Force, and he's going to talk to us today about both invasive plants and animals. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike. Give the lights. There you go. Okay, so uh, you all go into it. Do you have a, for if there's anyone on Zoom or whatever, do you have like a chat that you keep track of that anyone has questions? Uh, okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll just questions just live in person. Okay, all right, that's fine. Yeah. Feel free to ask questions, interrupt, make comments, whatever, all along the way. Um, it actually helps me actually. <laughs> um, so yeah, if anything comes up, let me know. Cause there's certainly, I mean, I know about the pine barrens, but probably not as much as you guys. So if there's something that's relevant here and I don't know it, let me know. It's always good to learn some more stuff, um, what things you might be seeing. So the strike team, um, our mission is to protect natural lands through coordinated strategic invasive species management. So the idea was we started about 15 years ago and um, there really was no sort of centralized location where everyone's knowledge could kind of come and park. Um, so the idea was to have people uh, have create that uh, opportunity and we have an app that you can report sightings to. We have, a, I'll show you all a little bit about us quickly, um, but our goal is to sort of serve as that sort of clearinghouse of information in the state about invasive species and the way we learn through our own things that we're doing but even more through people telling us what they know um, and then we try to reflect that back out to the entire community so we do a lot of mapping data analysis and reporting we do a lot of outreach we do training um, and we also do sort of the you know nuts and bolts of searching and eradicating being guided by early detection and rapid response so there's a lot of species that they will not be getting put back in the box um, widespread species you're never going to you know dent them other than in particular locations where you might do a restoration or something like that we're concerned about slowing down the pace at which inv new invasive species yeah. get introduced so we really try to focus our efforts on early detection, rapid response for the newer species. We kill, we'll kill anything, trust me. Um, but we we um, we try to really focus on early detection, rapid response. So we have staff. Everyone here is is part time to very part time. Um, we mainly exist on grants and contracts. Um, and but we do have sort of a deep bench of people with lots of different experience so it's um it's a good crew um we have a steering committee of four people that help guide us uh you know sort of thinking statewide um and then we have a nice deep bench of uh, technical advisory committee that um help us make our list help us rate species how far uh, are they progressing towards becoming widespread and this includes all different kinds of experts. So it's plant people and aquatic plant people in particular and fish people and mammals and pests and pathogens, whatever could be anything alive that could be invasive. There's people on this technical advisory committee that help us understand um, the status of these species, whether we should worry about them or not and how bad are they or not. Um, so yeah, we really, strongly rely on this technical advisory committee so as always you know you, you talk about invasive species there has to be a why you're concerned about it and the why is all the good things so you know um there's quite a bit in new jersey um that's left that uh quite a bit of the biodiversity that's worth protecting 2000 native species <clears throat> Lots of different uh, elements to our fauna. Um, dragonflies are, are particularly rich diversity in New Jersey. Um, Sussex County has the greatest number of dragonfly and damselfly species of any county in the country, for example. 
We have a disproportionate amount of the population of the federally listed bog turtle. Same with the globally rare northern meadowlark butterfly. We have rattlesnakes, we have bears, we have bobcats, we have all kinds of good things still here in New Jersey that are worth protecting. You know, and overall, we're trying to, um, we know that one of the things that make a piece of land susceptible is its general health, just like human health. If you're not healthy, you're more susceptible to, to disease. Um, similarly, our forests, when they're not in a healthy state, they're more susceptible to infestation. So if you don't have, all of these things, you know, you have canopy trees, subcanopy trees, uh, regenerating trees and shrubs, lots of wildflowers. You know, if you don't have all those things and you have open space between the, the plants, you're just setting yourself up to be susceptible to invasion. So, all right, we, we're from New Jersey. These are great graphics that, um, um, uh, the folks at uh, Rutgers and Rowan have made about land use changes over the years in New Jersey. And you'll notice how the Pine Barrens doesn't get as red as everyone else. <laughs> you know, so we have specific specific protections there and that's why it isn't becoming measled <laughs> like the rest of the state. Um, but, you know, all together, you know, about half of the state is still in a natural condition. So that's, that's a lot of land, that's two and a half million acres that are still in a natural condition. Now, because of all the development around them, it increases their susceptibility to problems, including invasive species. Um, but we do still have quite a bit of land mass that is in a natural, uh, natural state. So we have challenged um, that land. Um, obviously there's the habitat destruction that we talked about, we don't have, 50% of our land in a natural state anymore. Um, we have overabundant deer as a major issue, invasive species, the topic of today, mostly invasive uh, soil modifications, under, underrated contributor to infestations of invasives. We've completely changed the fire regimes. You know, if you went back four or 500 years, fire was way more prevalent on the landscape, even outside of the Pinelands. Um, than it has been in more recent times. And there's no way that when you take something that's shaped e all the ecosystems in New Jersey and you remove it, you might expect a consequence. Um, so, you know, that's another one of the elements, um, you know, not to mention little things like climate change, everything's fixed like that. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, lot of challenges to the 50% of the land that's remaining. As far as uh, non-native plants go, the perspective is, you know, about 10,000 introductions of non-native plants. That's a very rough estimate, but it, it's in the ballpark of giving you the gist that a lot, <laughs> a lot of non-native plants have been introduced. Out of that, about a thousand are established non-native. So these could be minor weeds here and there, don't really change the plant community dramatically. And that's the majority of non-native species that are in our flora. So the problems start out of that original 10,000, the problems start here. There's about 50 widespread invasive plants and about a hundred more that are emerging invasive plants. So that's why the strike team, when we started putting all these numbers together, like that's really bad. That plus that would be much, much, much worse. So that's where early detection rapid response comes in. We want to slow down the rate of things going from this column to this column. And unfortunately, over the last 15 years, when we've been really looking at this closely and how many um, populations are out there, how big, where they are, distributed, et cetera, et cetera, this started at 35, 15 years ago. And you know, mostly because we're paying attention more we know that that number is now about 50 and not 35 anymore. A lot of things have become widespread or we've noticed that they're widespread after we started looking and having huge amounts of people reporting what they're telling to us. So it became apparent that there were really more widespread species than we thought. Um, so yeah, generally an invasive plant, um, by definition, there's a National Invasive Species Council 
they're introduced to an area outside of their natural range and they can grow densely and exclude other species. So they cause, they're from, they're not from North America by definition, and they do things like this garlic mustard. So to, to separate them from chicory that grows along the roadside and doesn't really have major impacts on natural systems, typically. Um, dandelions, major problem in your lawn, not so major of a problem in a natural area. So, um, you know, there's a distinction. And I always get, well, isn't poison ivy invasive? Um, it's by definition, it's only invasive if it's not native to the area you're looking in. Poison ivy is native. You might not like it. You might call it a weed. You might call it any other name you want, <laughs> but you can't call it invasive by definition. The definition is the definition is from some other uh, part of the world, and then it grows densely and excludes other species. So there are weedy natives, um, but we don't call them invasive. We call them weedy natives. So in the scheme of things, when you have massive overabundance of deer, um, one of the biggest filters of that 10,000 species of introductions is of those 10,000 ones that deer don't eat. There's no inherent deer resistance for a non-native plant. There are herbivores all around the world that eat plants. <laughs> you know, it's that, and it's not that they don't know what to do with them. Deer will sniff a leaf and taste every single darn one of them. When they have an unfortunate reaction, <laughs> then they'll stop eating it. So it's not that non-native plants are just foreign to deer and they don't know what to do with them. They've tried. And the ones, the non-native plants that become invasive are the ones that they've tried and don't eat for whatever reason. They're protected by some compound that makes them um, not taste good or they can't digest it. Um, but you know, they, they will try everything literally. There's no two ways about that. Um, and then you got the general weedy characters, you know, they tolerate a wider variety of soil types, wider variety of light levels. They mature quickly and produce lots of seeds. That's the definition of a weed more generally. Um, and yeah, and in a lot of ways, you know, a lot of invasive plants are sold. You know, there, there's no restriction in New Jersey. We're one of few states in the entire country that has no regulated species list of things you can't sell. Um, it's actually to the point of total embarrassment. <laughs> you know, I mean, Mississippi, Montana, Idaho, all those really progressive states that want to protect nature, they have lists. We don't. We have nothing. So yeah, we're far behind. We're far behind on other aspects related to aquatic invasive species. There, we're finally, New Jersey is getting on board with that. Same thing, we're a holdout of one of several states in the entire country that never thought it was necessary to do. So we're, we're really kind of behind the eight ball on these things. The, the majority of the country has moved on to considering this a much more serious problem than New Jersey has. Um, all right, regardless. So. You know, why are invasive species bad? So this is one example typical of New Jersey outside of the Pine Barrens. Um, but autumn olive was in the 60s produced in mass quantities by the US Department of Agriculture and given away for free as great wildlife food. You know, so people, hey, free, I'll take free, here's a great price. I was just talking to someone this morning who got his hunting license probably, I don't know, 40 plus years ago. And he said when he got his hunting license, they gave him a pack of autumn olive seeds <laughs> with the license. So it was like, hey, we can, we can make nature better. We can give wildlife food. And they are great for wildlife food. So I picked this example because this is probably out of all the invasives, a bigger contributor than many other invasives. So it produces tons of flowers that pollinators absolutely love. So in May, pollinators are happy. So an old field gets abandoned, that's the context here. In the past, you'd get this, this is only a small subset of the species an old field would have. And now in most places, that's all you get, or you get almost all autumn olive or calorie pear or whatever other invasive. So olive makes lots of flowers, then they make lots of fruit and everything from a chickadee to a bear will eat it. 
you know, and so it has value that way. But if this were where you could get your food for your sustenance, well, if you're above, if you're a B, May is a great month. Now what do I do? What do I do in the other growing season months when I'd have flowers from all these different things? They're gone. It's only one choice, one time. If you need fruit to survive, great. You can get that in September and October. What about all the other months? So it's like if you had a supermarket and you could only get fresh perish perishable foods twice a year, you clearly would not make it. You know, so obviously that's an oversimplification. There are other fields and other places where something can get it, but chipping it away at it over time, lowering the amount of this diverse set of food items down to a fewer set of food items leads to problems. So it's been documented that out of all the entire, if you take all the birds in North America and said, this is the total number of them, 50 years ago, we have one third less now than we had 50 years ago. So we've lost one third of the individual birds in 50 years. Uh, pollinators, to, uh, you know, insects in general, I, I don't know the numbers exactly, but it might be more like 20%. We're losing huge amounts of our biodiversity. Invasives are definitely part of the problem. So while it's great if you're a bee or a bear or a chickadee at this time frame, um, if you're an insect that feeds on leaves of plants, you're screwed because bees aren't edible to insects. Bees all have some level of edibility to an insect. So if I can't eat the leaves of this, if bugs can't eat the leaves of that, then birds can't eat the bugs. So you, you, there's sort of a logical connection there um, that, you know, sure, I mentioned a whole bunch of other problems that we have, but this is definitely logically one of the hugest, huge sources of the problem. We're eliminating food from the food web. So you're going to lose stuff. So the timing is huge. And again, another reason why we're, we focus on early detection and rapid response to the extent we can. Um, in 19, before European settlement, there were estimated to be 10 deer per square mile. In 1900, there were zero deer per square mile because of unregulated commercial venison sales. So humans have the ability to eliminate any animal we so desire. <laughs> we are good at making things go extinct. It's in our, it's in our blood. Um, and we did. So there was a great effort by Fish and Wildlife. Like I said, different names all over the years. But they brought deer back to where they were pre-European by 1972. So 50 years ago, there wasn't a deer problem. By the 80s, it became the apparent through the 70s and into the 80s and 90s, that we had a major deer problem. You know, currently I measure in Hopewell and Mercer County over hundred deer per square mile. In most places, um, you know, in Northern New Jersey, the most sort of more pristine Northern Highlands and things like that, maybe you'll get 50 deer per square mile. That's either five times too many or 10 times too many. <laughs> Neither one's great. So, you know, again, there's this huge, relatively new, 50 years is a blink of an eye from nature's point of view, pressure on our native plants um, that in the same time frame as when invasive species went preserved. It's not a coincidence. In the 1950s, and you could look at um, all the old floras of New Jersey, you know, investigations of the flora of New Jersey, Jay Kelly's done an amazing job looking at a lot of them. Um, but you look back and there's hardly a whisper about invasive species in the 1950s. You know, Japanese honeysuckle is probably our oldest invasive. You even look at things that we think of as, you know, they're just widespread, they're everywhere. Japanese stillgrass, Japanese barberry. Those didn't really start getting documented as invasive until the 80s, less than 50 years. So we're caused a dramatic, really dramatic shift in our plant communities in a short period of time 
And then we're going to scratch our heads why all the birds are disappearing and why all the bugs are disappearing. <laughs> you know, you can't treat nature that way and expect no consequences. So we've talked a lot about deer already, but you know, 10 deer per square mile is seems to be a magic number. So the historic estimate that I mentioned, there's this number is associated with uh, breaking the Lyme disease cycle, deer vehicle collisions being knocked down significantly, and healthy forests. So there was researchers that put a certain known density of deer inside a fence with a forest and then said how many deer what's the deer density where the forest starts to lose stuff anything above 10 is when the forest started to lose stuff first the wildflowers then the tree seedlings and shrub seedlings so when the higher you went above 10 the worse the damage would be so 10 does appear to be a recurring magic number so to speak um So why is that? So excellent deer habitat, we fragmented our forests and they love edges of forest. In all these tan areas, this is Hopewell Township. So within all these tan areas are um, agricultural fields, developments, a, a, a literal salad bowl for deer to wallow in and eat. You know, if you think a deer is going to make as many offspring eating oak leaves as soybean leaves, you're wrong. Oak leaves, although they're edible and deer do like eating them, they got to fight through all the tannins and everything else to digest them. The, our agricultural crops are just, you know, nothing there. You can just digest and build protein in your body much more easily than eating any of the native flora. So we really give them a lot to eat. We have overall insufficient deer management. Um, and that's for a number of reasons. One is about, in Hopewell, about 40% of the land is not accessible to hunters at all. That clearly is a problem. Where there is access, the majority of recreational hunters, they're recreational hunters. They're not professional deer managers that are trying to reduce the population. Sure, they take deer and they eat them, but their goal often is not to reduce the deer population. So whatever you regulations are, no matter how liberal they are, New Jersey's are liberal than many other states, if hunters are self-regulating, then you do not get a population reduction with hunting. At best, you can maintain the status quo with recreational hunting. And more likely to do that when you have access to more than 60% of the land mass. So there's two problems. There's a lack of hunting access and there's a lack of hunting uh, for deer management to reduce the deer herd. And then you get all the fun problems, lime, the collisions, ag losses. Um, just in Hopewell alone, there's about 500 deer vehicle collisions a year. Times that by 500, which is most people's deductible on their car insurance, then you get a large number <laughs> in one place, in one town in New Jersey. We're paying for this deer overabundance uh, one way or the other. Not to mention if you're a farmer, although they are feeding the deer, it's clearly inadvertent. They do not want to be feeding the deer, um, but it's just a consequence. So yeah, that's why we're in the problem we are. And, to be honest with you, a large part of the Pine Barrens is inedible to deer. Um, you know, pitch pine or, um, you know, black huckleberry. And, you know, there's a whole slew of base species here that deer don't eat. I mean, I think the hypothesis, at least my hypothesis, when you're living in a low nutrient environment, you do not let just any herbivore come by and took off that hard fought leaf you just made. So you have compounds in you that make you unpalatable, poisonous, toxic, or undigestible to deer. At the same time, I've seen browse lines in the pine barrens, you know, in wetlands and things like that um, in particular, where I, it's clear as day, I see a, there's a browse line, <laughs> you know, so how, how much of an impact deer have in the Pinelands versus other parts of the state, it's definitely a smaller impact, but there is definitely an impact. 
anything that is edible is getting eaten in the Pine Barrens at a level that's not sustainable in the long term, even though many of the common species are not being eaten at all. So it's a, it's a trickier, less obvious thing as a general rule, but I would not count out the impacts of deer in the Pine Barrens. So how do you lose the forest? Forests lose trees, trees fall, storms, disease, whatever. Unfortunately, what you get back are, un, are invasive species that deer don't eat. Instead of new trees, you get this. Lucky for us, if we ever do wise up, whenever you go through a forest, you see little seedlings of native trees and shrubs everywhere. There is, nature has not an infinite amount of ability to recover, but a really strong ability to recover. We really just got to get it the hell out of their way. The plants, I mean. And if we, you know, in this case, we fostered overabundant deer for various reasons. If we could mitigate that impact that we've created, nature will do a very good job of healing itself. So often you'll have forests that are like this. This is a good, not often. Often you do not have a good forest that's very healthy and has a nice dense understory and trees little trees waiting in, in the wings for a big tree to fall down that it'll pop right up into. That's very rare. Often you have on lands that were never tilled agriculturally, you have a completely empty forest in the understory. Places that were tilled in the past for agricultural use are often exceptionally weedy with invasive species that deer don't eat. <clears throat> so that's sort of the three basic types of forests that we have. You know, so again, we, we really try to focus on emerging things, things that are new to a specific area and have demonstrated potential to become invasive and trying to get out in front of them to keep them from becoming widespread. So overall, we have 144 target species, 99 plants, 45 animals, and then we rank them by stage. So stage zero could be anything from not here yet, but in a neighboring state up to about 10 known populations. Stage one would be 11 to 100 known populations. So you get the gist. If we rank them and by their rarity, so to speak, um, we have a way to suggest what you should focus your priorities on an invasion. So if you have a piece of land and you have a stage zero species, that's the first one you do. And then you go to stage one, two, three, then you get to your widespread species that might have bigger infestation levels. Fortunately, for much of the core of the Pine Barrens, you know, even things that are widespread outside of the Pine Barrens are emerging inside. I could think of Japanese stillgrass as an example around the edges of wet areas, um, areas where soils have been modified in some way to make them richer than your typical Pine Barren soil. Those often collect invasive species in patches. Um, so a lot of things in the Pine Barrens would be treated as emerging, even if they're widespread outside of the Pine Barrens. So yeah, you go after the stage zeros. Um, you know, sickleweed is a personal one for me. Someone found it at White Lake in Warren County. They identified it as sickleweed. They say, Mike, you ever hear of sickleweed? I'm like, nope. <laughs> um, so I look it up and like, whoa, it's a major rangeland pest. Um, you know, they, they had just done a meadow restoration. So it was like, huh, I wonder if it'll be a rangeland pest here or a pest in meadows here in New Jersey. Let's wait 10 years and find out. Of course you don't do that. <laughs> if you have one isolated patch, you kill it. You don't wait to find out whether it's going to be an invasive. It has invasive tendencies elsewhere. You just found the only patch anyone's ever seen in New Jersey, at least that we know of, you kill it. You don't wait to see whether it'll become invasive. And that's how you slow down the rate of new invasions. Um, you know, so yeah, there's, there's this is often cited invasive species stuff, the invasion curve. It gets introduced, it builds slowly up to some level where someone says, aha, I found it, this new thing. No one ever saw it before. And if you don't do anything, you know, the public generally becomes aware of it when it becomes a nuisance, when there's a ton of it. Like, what is all this stuff that's creeping all over the back fence now? Um, and then eventually it levels out. 
but you only have the ability to eradicate when you're very low down on the curve. It's just impractical once it starts becoming really abundant. So this is a story from Hopewell, Chinese silvergrass, which I have also seen in the Pine Barrens on roadsides and other along cranberry bogs. Um, you know, this was a really nice moist meadow with one Chinese silvergrass in it. Clearly what you do, you know it has this tendency. Clearly you kill the one plant, <laughs> you know. I could have obsessed about all the invasives in the woods and say, well, this is a bigger problem. I got to do this bigger problem. Yeah, do the bigger problem after you spend five minutes stopping a future infestation. You know, that we have to start thinking about invasions in that way. Um, first, prevent future damage, then go back in time and mop up to the extent you can things that have already happened. So I mentioned this before, um, you know, basically the way you get the most invasives is if the land was tilled for agricultural use and you have a lot of deer, that's when you get most invasives. If the land were never tilled for agriculture and you have low amount of deer, that's when you have the least amount of invasives and the most natives. Um, and basically the soil is so modified after agricultural use that it's sort of unrecognizable as a native forest soil anymore. And the long story short is that favors weeds of all kinds, native and non-native. Um, so if you're going to do stewardship and you have limited resources, which everyone doing stewardship has limited resources, the first thing you try to address is deer. Then you go to invasives and you start with the ones that are the most uncommon in the state but have potential. And then you work your way up the ladder. And then if you have resources, then you go after restoring areas that might be heavily infested. So, you know, it really is a matter of being very um, disciplined and working on the things that have the most bang for the buck. So for the strike team's history, we've searched 800,000 of the 5 million acres in New Jersey. We've documented 20,000 populations. Clearly there's more than that um, if you count widespreads. This counts everything widespread and emerging. And we've knocked out 5,000 of those 20,000. So we're, we're doing everything we can. Um, and you know we do things through, like I said, grants, United, Far uh, United States Forest Service. Um, they've been generous to us multiple times. And we have a new grant. We work a lot with private landowners. Um, we did have one from our last grant in the Pine Barrens, but we didn't find one invasive species on the property. <laughs> um, so that was, so we, we, we obviously, you know, it's not quite as, um, you know, relevant to, to the Pineland in some ways, although, you know, beautiful, you know, intact areas of forest that are amazing down here, there isn't as much invasion to worry about, um, but uh, we do work with private landowners and um, counties and things like that. This one is Mercer and Morris County, New Jersey Audubon, um, Sour Island Conservancy that's on this rampage of planting ridiculous amounts of trees to replace the dead ash trees from Emerald Ash Borer. And we work with, uh, we have contracts on a regular basis with a number of groups, including these from federal down to municipal. We do a lot of training and outreach. And one thing I wanted to emphasize is um, volunteer stewardship teams. So, um, you know, again, anywhere in the Pine Barrens or not, you know, there's there are areas that are susceptible because mostly because of disturbance here and modifications of the soil. But this concept of volunteer stewardship teams, I absolutely love this and whatever I can possibly do to support people, I will do. Um, so the gist of it is you have one or two or three core people. You have cooperation of the landowner. There's a sort of an adoption, a stewardship adoption process where you work with the landowner. And then what you do is the successful ones have regular volunteer work days. Every Thursday morning from nine to 11, every Saturday from two to four, whatever have it be the same all the time. So the core people might show up every time or almost every time and people will float in and out. But, and when they know it's a regular day and time, they're more likely to show up. 
And basically what you do too is you, you have projects where you could tick boxes. So if, if the goal is, hey, we've adopted this park and we're going to kill every invasive species on it. Well, that might be possible in the pinelands. <laughs> um, in, in, in most other places, that is the most ridiculous goal ever that you will never achieve and you'll give up. So you say, okay, we're going to track species X at this park. And when we're done getting rid of all of species X, we're going to go on to Y. Or we're going to take that area that's infested with mugwort and we're going to obliterate it over time and make a native meadow. So you take projects that you could start and finish. And that is absolutely the key with anything stewardship. Because it's way too easy to wallow in the mess <laughs> and not really make progress. You have to very narrowly define goals, complete that goal, move to the next goal, complete that goal, move to the next goal. And there are a number of these around the state. We have uh, on our website, um, how you can try to link up with one that might be close to you or guidance if you want to start your own. Um, but the, the general gist is they have a, a very concise long-term plan with things that you can do and then move to the next one, do that, move to the next one. And that seems to be the secret for, for all the different groups. This is a mini, a small subset. Um, so if anyone wanted to do something like this, please let me know and I will try to help you, point you to someone who's closer to where you're thinking, whatever. Um, come visit your site and look at it and talk about what would be a prioritized plan, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I think no entity, private, federal, state, municipal, county, nonprofit, has enough resources to do good stewardship across all of the lands that they're responsible for. And we need volunteer stewardship teams. We absolutely need them. So um, the amount of stewardship resources, if this grows even more, could be very substantial improvement relative to how much stewardship's being put into the land without these great people. You know, there, there are some that are just ridiculous like they put all those groups that own land to shame <laughs> the amount of work they do the great swamp team the friends of great swamp team they're they're just a machine like they do not give up the the amount of invasives they've killed is just off the charts and like i said it would put almost any other entity government or nonprofit, to shame with the amount of work that they've done um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of great volunteer uh, stewardship team uh, capacity out there that's developing and should be encouraged to develop more. Um, I will skip through most of this other than the punchline, but we've done monitoring at Duke Farms for probably in the 15 year range as well. Um, and a severely impacted place that had 250 deer per square mile for many years. and uh, there was a paper and someone who knows statistics did this, but the gist is the ratio of native to non-native plants within their deer exposure increased dramatically. So you're getting relative to the amount of plants that were non-native, the cover of non-native plants, the cover of native plants went up dramatically. In an unexposed area where they just have a really good deer management program, it also went up dramatically. So when we say like, well, what, what are we gonna do get out of all of our stewardship efforts? We're not going back to 1492, <laughs> ain't happening. But if you can make it better, that's the goal. Make it better than it was. Shoot, at the rate we're declining, making it, even keeping it at zero from where you start doing work would be an amazing accomplishment. And you could actually turn back the clock to some extent and give native species the ability to compete against non-natives. So yeah, this is a forest that um, has less deer pressure on it and it's filled with tree seedlings in central New Jersey. Japanese stillgrass. Oh, it's, you, can't, you can't compete with Japanese stillgrass. Um, yeah, you can, if the deer aren't eating the competition all the time. Those are hickory seedlings. There's a Japanese barberry in here. It's a where's Waldo for botanists. There's a little bit of Japanese barberry in here getting smothered by tree, native trees and shrubs, not a drop of herbicide. So we keep thinking that invasives, they're more competitive. 
they're more competitive when their competition gets eaten to that. So if we take that pressure off, let native, like I said, get the hell out of the way. <laughs> if we get out of the way by reducing the deer population, all of a sudden native species become more abundant, like magic. They're more competitive. They're just also more yummy. Same thing, this one's easier to see, but this barberry is doomed. He's getting smothered by native trees and shrubs. So um, we go to 2.30, is that the, the time frame? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I'm, I'm just gonna make sure yeah. I- Just while this is for, yeah. uh, once you get done, I can throw a slide in. Okay. And take calls from the audience. Oh, cool, so okay, very good. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's good. All right, so I'm not gonna go over every slide I have in this whole thing. If people want the presentation for their own purposes, I'm glad to give it out, um, but I'm not gonna hit every single slide in detail. Oh, yeah, my we can host the full presentation with next to the live stream. So okay. they can have stream, but they can also have the PowerPoint. If that's perfect. Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. So one of the things as far as control goes is when you're in a hole, you stop digging as the expression goes. If the state is not going to regulate invasive species like just about every other state has, then we're left with just voluntarily trying to reduce the sale of invasive species. So every year we make it updated, do not plant lists. And we ask people do things moving forward that you might buy, avoid the things on this list. Stop making it worse. That's the general goal of this. If we stop buying these plants, there'll be less demand to buy them. And at the very least, you could say, I'm not making the problem worse. So, you know, do not plant list. We put it out every year. It's on our website updated. Um, Again, just emphasizing the only, there's a lot of different types of control. The most important one is going to be ecological control through deer herd reduction. On a bigger scale, that is our only chance. We, we have to allow native plants to compete effectively. So I said, I, I, I think <clears throat> I'll kind of blow by some of this, but just know it's there. As a homeowner, you could apply anything you want on your land that you own. That's good and bad. <laughs> um, if out, if you are if you're a land manager for the state or a nonprofit, you have to be a commercial pesticide um, applicator or operator. You have to have training, take tests, um, et cetera, to to know what to do. Um, we try to make for every single invasive plant that there is in New Jersey. We have recommendations for treatment, and I'll just skip. Uh, I believe there's all different kinds of methods. So for every species, we have these methods with names on them. So you might look up Japanese barberry and we'll say, you know, FS1, foliar spray number one, which is these two herbicides at these percentages. We have a, a accompanying table that says how many ounces of this per gallon to add to your jug. So we try to make it as easy as possible. And if you're doing something on your own home, that's fine, that's legit, but we're trying to make it so that often I hear people like, yeah, I used it straight out of the bottle. I'm like, oh, that is really unnecessary, <laughs> way overkill, a total waste and a bad thing. If you need 3% solution of something and you use the concentrate instead of a, something diluted to 3%, that is a dramatic waste of an herbicide. And we really don't want to use more herbicides than we absolutely have to. So we have lots of guidance for people. And I get emails all the time. You know, people will ask questions and that's part of my job is to answer questions from the public. So please, anyone can feel free to contact me anytime if they want to know how to kill something or, or a good native plant, anything. Um, so yeah, I wanna leave room for questions. Um, within the core of the Pine Barrens, there's a, a pretty limited set of, of things. I would say off the top of my head, uh, like I mentioned, Chinese silvergrass seems to have some inroads in the Pinelands and in, in more disturbed areas. Um, weeping lovegrass seems to love the Pine Barrens and was intentionally planted for many years. Chinese, Bush clover 
There's also a very prevalent pest in the Pine Barrens, especially again on roadsides, again, where it was purposely introduced and seeded, um, oftentimes on modified soils to make things grow better. Um, um, still grass on the edges of wetlands in particular, but I would say wetlands would be much more susceptible to still grass if they're not like super inundated wetlands. So I've gotten plenty of, of people say, I found still grass here, there, and around in the Pine Barrens. Um, and Phragmites is clearly another issue, significant issue in the Pine Barrens. There are likely others, um, but I would say in my experience and what people have told me, those are the main ones in the Pine Barrens. But if you live in the Pine Barrens and have a yard, it's likely not going to be sort of pristine pine barren soil, you could end up with just about anything, you know? So um, we do, like I said, we provide guidance on how to kill just about, uh, to kill every, not just about, we have guidance on how to kill every single invasive plant in New Jersey. Um, so calorie pair, if you're more towards the intercoastal plain, this could be a significant problem for you. Um, Japanese Aurelia, mostly seems to be in northern New Jersey, but um, you know, I, I would suspect it anywhere, certainly intercoastal plain. You know, there's a lot of species and these are just certain ones. I, I, I do want to kind of chop things off to see if there's any questions and stuff, because that's honestly more fun um, to talk than to, for everyone to talk to just me. I'll stop at, you know, Tree of Heaven, I've seen isolated in the Pine Barrens and high, heavily disturbed areas. Uh, buckthorn is unlikely to be a problem here in the core, but is a very significant threat throughout the rest of New Jersey. As is glossy buckthorn and barberry. Yeah, it's just, uh, again, it's just showing you what's on this presentation if you want to look at it closer. And, you know, every one of them has, you know, how to kill it. This is hugely popping up from Cape May and has worked its way up through the state. This is totally, has all the signs of climate change. Um, been invasive in other places warmer than here. Started being invasive, South Jersey. You can go in Cape May forest and other forests in South Jersey through the intercoastal plain and the entire ground in the forest is covered with English ivy. Um, and now they're popping up isolated places from seed all throughout northern New Jersey as well. Um, so this is likely one that one of the things with climate change to worry about is uh, what a group at um, University of Massachusetts Amherst they call sleepers. So they look at the ranges of species, their native ranges, their invasive introduced ranges. And they say, well, we know that in 50 years, the climate in New Jersey is going to be like North Carolina. Which species might we expect to become more invasive because of climate change in New Jersey? And the first thing is plants can move long distances. But the first problems are going to be things that are in our landscapes now. They were fine in our landscapes coddled by us. And they couldn't survive because it was too cold otherwise. In a lot of cases like this one, they couldn't make ripe fruit fast enough. It would get too cold before their fruit ripened. Now the growing season's just a little bit longer. Now they can ripen fruit and spread. So the, the sleepers are the ones that are in our landscapes now, never thought of them as invasive. Now it's a little bit warmer, the growing season's a little longer, now they can become invasive. So those are the ones in our landscapes that we gotta really worry about is those sleepers. Wisteria definitely is okay with reasonably nutrient poor uh, soils. Maybe not poor pine barrens, but they are nitrogen fixers. They're in that family, the bean family. But plenty of other South Jersey places have lots of it. Um, Gorsalin berry is probably another uh, climate change one. Same for winter creeper. Silver grasses around in the pine barrens and disturbed areas. Not weed was mentioned as being right around this building that we're in right now. <laughs> um, the key to killing that, let it come up to its full size in early June, cut it down to the ground, let it grow two or three feet, then hit it with herbicide. 
you're basically, if you hit it when it has a full intact root, you lose. You have to weaken the root somehow, let it use a bunch of energy to send up a bunch of shoots, cut the shoots off. Whoops, the roots are now smaller. Um, and now it's much more susceptible to herbicide. And still grass, we talked about as definitely being uh, edges of pinelands, wetlands. So yeah, that's that's the entirety of the presentation. Um, So the big thing I just look is like small steps. You know, tackle yeah. what you can tackle. Yes. Or you're going to get overburdened and you may never get it done, but yeah. identify that a little bit and then grow. Yes. As you go forward. Absolutely. There's no other. It's way too easy to become discouraged dealing with invasives. Yeah. And to be honest with you, you know, even among the sort of nonprofit, professional nonprofit state people like doing land management, you know, 15, 20 plus years ago, it was just very reactionary. I have a huge barberry infestation. I got to get rid of it. So you get 3% of it gone. Okay. <laughs> but at the same time, you let Siebold's viburnum, which is a way bigger threat, ultimately. Yeah. And you only had three of them when you started working on your barberry, and then you let that go to become hundreds and hundreds because you didn't know that it was a problem. And that's what the strike team is meant to do is say, hey, think about these species first, then move on to a bigger project. And if you're going to take on barberry, start with a quarter acre here, a quarter acre there. You know, take bites that you could chew and digest as opposed to assuming you're going to get rid of everything, so to speak, and losing and giving up and getting nothing done, ultimately. And there's a contributing factor like like the deer. You have to do something to address the deer. Yeah. Right? In a lot of ways, it's going to be off or not in the long run. Anyway. Yeah, that, that's definitely unfortunate, but true. Um, but when you already have really, you know, infested forests, deer or no deer, you have to start by trying to chip away at that. Right. Often, often what people will do is they'll say the, the the logical thing that most people come to is you start with vine control. You can see vines pulling down trees that if they are pulled down, it's going to create more light gaps for more invasives to flourish. Start by you doing vine control. Get them out of your trees as your first step. You know, so that that that's often a good strategy. Um, you know, and, and there are, you know, things you can do as far as like, don't forget the restoration part of it. So if you clear some invasive in a forest and you have too many deer, part of your plan could be preferably the landowner themselves paying for it, but buy larger trees that you just have to put buffer up guards on. So you do your, you do your big clearing and then you plant trees in a strategic way where you, you have less to worry about from the deer. So now we're up if uh, folks want to uh, call that phone number on the screen, which is uh, 1-929-205-6099. Uh, and the ID number there is below it is uh, 840-0544-1223. And uh, we, can, we can speak your questions if you call in uh, through our Zoom. And we'll see if anybody else. Hmm? And we'll see. We know there's a fair amount of people watching the YouTube stream. Okay. So now they they have this number so they can call. Okay. If they have questions. Yeah, it's interesting that you know some of the differences between the like coastal plain, the outer coastal plain, what we see in the pine barrens and yeah. other parts of New Jersey. Yeah, there there's Coastal communities are heavily infested, okay. you know, but it's that core of the pine, and it can be very sandy. Yeah. But, you know, the core of the pine barrens has a lot more protection in the soil. Right. And most of it hasn't been altered by past agricultural activity. So, like a limiting factor. Yeah. It, was, it limited farmers from yeah. mucking with it because it was useless to do so because you couldn't grow anything no matter what you did. Right. <laughs> um, but, um, Oops, but yeah, there's, there's that mix. 
Hello, uh, you're live on the air with your question. Hi, oh. hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we come in live clear. Okay, thank you. This has been wonderful and, you know, kind of <laughs> upsetting, right? Because we're all affected by this. Um, I wish there were more, more people on the call. So, but thank you for educating us. As a resident in Camden County, um, do you know any, I see on the website, there's not a whole lot going on with the strike team in Camden County. Um, I guess, well, okay. So looking in my backyard and how it's changed over the past 50 years, um, what, is there a recommendation? So right now it's been taken over with stilt grass. There's a branch of the um, uh, Cooper River that flows through. And so this green acres behind, across the river, there's a, like an acre of, of green acres, which has been just taken over. I guess, is there like a chart plan, like where to start? I mean, I know you said vine, pull, pull down all the vines, and because it, it is kind of overwhelming. So it's like once we pull down the vines, then what? Yeah, I mean, I think if your problem is stilt grass, it's almost, I, I mean, I, I don't, I, I can't see the habitat, obviously, so I'm, I'll make guesses, but stilt grass often is a problem where the deer have removed the understory. So yeah. one of the strategies, and it could be small scale, you know, almost all the time, no matter how degraded a site is, if you look, you will find little tree seedlings, little shrub seedlings. Yeah. Even just starting by putting cages around them will allow that layer of, so still grass can live under a canopy of trees shade from trees it cannot live under the canopy of trees plus the canopy of a shrub layer so that double shade layer keeps still grass out so if you can encourage the native the native uh seedlings that are likely there at some amount if you can encourage them to get up over the browse line that will help mitigate your still grass problem i'm not saying it's a fast answer or an easy answer um but still grass in particular, it's, it's um, you know, if the main reason is deer have removed the understory, it's hard to correct that problem by just saying, oh, just, just spray them with herbicide and kill the still grass. You could do that multiple years in a row and burn out the seed bank. But if you mm -hmm. just allow those native things to start growing, again, on a small scale, take, take one bite at a time allow protect things that are already there or plant some new things but yeah. often it's a matter of finding those little guys putting a cage on them and let them do their work um free from yeah. your brows um that, might... that, that, um thank you that I mean that sounds great do you recommend a certain cage i mean i would never spray there's a little vernal a uh, pond right there which there's a lot of frogs in there and i guess uh, the concern is you know the in, how is how are they going to be impacted in x amount of years you know um, yeah, I mean, you don't want to repeatedly spray anywhere um yeah you know, I, I would never do that all the time like well i have to spray you know will will the plant become resistant to herbicide and my response is only if you're doing it wrong, you shouldn't be spraying so much that a plant could develop resistance. In the case of this situation, where you're, you find little tree seedlings or shrub seedlings, you put a cage around them, put like a couple few inches of wood chips, like in a radius around the plant, um, do that in say early March, and the still grass will not be able to germinate up through it within that little area. So that'll give your little seed and a little breathing room to get going more quickly. And no herbicide. Well, that's, that's wonderful. Do you have a link on the website to like where we can get these little cages? Not really. I mean, you could buy, you know, I often, you can use any material you want to make some kind of barrier that deer can't get through. 
Um, I'll often buy like a five foot roll of whatever, 50 or 100 foot roll of five foot tall galvanized metal fencing. And I like using rebar as posts because you could pound it into soil even if it's rocky. Um, and you just, you know, make it, you know, at least three foot in diameter or so, so the plant has a little bit of room. But it literally could be plastic, metal, anything that would keep deer out of it. I've seen people use all kinds of, all kinds of stuff. It's effective. As long as it keeps deer out, it's effective. Um, yeah. I use five foot galvanized metal fencing. Um, if I need to buy any kind of material, that's typically what I would buy. Okay. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks for your question. Again, if anybody else has a question and you're watching on YouTube, feel free to call in. Um, we'll hang here for a few minutes and uh, take some questions we got. Any questions from the audience? Here? I have a question. Okay. Uh, for someone like me that doesn't have a background in environmental science, okay. um, I'm always impressed when I do a site visit with somebody who knows their stuff and can say, oh, there's the debates, there's the debates. Right. Are there any <clears throat> tricks or tips for the layman to say where invasive species are a problem or any warning signs to look for? I mean, we have we have an interactive map on our website that you could kind of drill down to where you live and see what little Google balloons show up and what species are in the vicinity of you that have been recorded. I love iNaturalist personally. Uh, it's a free app. It includes plants and animals and bugs and all kinds of stuff. It will get you in the ballpark really fast. Um, you know, even if it's it's a, an amazing entry point for for people that aren't botanists or whatever. And to be honest with you, I, I so I know a number of plants, but sometimes I, I can't remember what the heck that was called. All right, iNaturalist, help me out here. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, or bugs. I don't know my bugs at all, really. I take a picture of every single bug I see, and this will almost always get me very close. And the beauty of it is it has AI to look at your picture and try to figure out what it is from its database, but it also gives you a list based on what other people have seen near you. So it's not going to say, oh, this looks like the California whatever. Like, clearly, it's not the California whatever. I'm in New Jersey. <laughs> you know, so it'll say, these are the things it looks like based on, and these are things that are possible based on your location. So I, I really, there's other ones, and I just, I'm not familiar enough to know if they're good too. I, 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 I've been uh, using iNaturalist personally, and it's not, it's not perfect, but it is way better than having no clue. It brings you into some realm of possibility, um, and you could and you could build on that, you know, rather than having, you know, a bunch of field guides, which I th still think are great. But you know, um, if you just happen to be casually hiking, you don't want to bring three or four field guides with you every time you go on a hike. Bah! Oh, that was good. <laughs> Your phone. <laughs> was that recording? That was me. <laughs> um, um, the phone's generally with you at all times. So you could have iNaturalist on it. And no matter what, where you ever you see something, you, you could use it to help you. Yeah, yeah it's, it's great. And, and the third part of it, the AI, the what's been seen near you, there's people that will look at what you say you, say you think it is and either confirm or or give you another suggestion. So there's you're, there's a pool of experts that you would have never had access to otherwise that you do now. So feel free to be wrong. I, I that's what I do. Like I don't know my bugs that well. Like it kind of looks like that, but I can see that. I'll give it a shot. And then you know, so and so says, "Nah, it's this other thing." I'm like, "Cool, thanks." <laughs> you know, I would not have known that otherwise. Did you talk about the app, Yukon? What's that? Did you talk about the app? You said there's an app. Yeah, yeah. So iNaturalist has nothing to do with us. Mm -hmm. um, but we have... Um, you guys have one for... Yeah, it's it's kind of... It's a regional app called EdMaps, E-D-D-M-A-P-S. Mm -hmm. And what our contribution to it is the list, when you, when you pick New Jersey from the list, it is the list that we, through our technical advisory committee, made. Mm -hmm. Again, including everything, plants, animals, fish, blah, blah, blah. So you, you could download EdMaps um, and 
it's pretty simple app, you know, I mean, once you get used to it, like any other app, um, and you could record observations that you made. So unlike iNaturalist, we'll just say, hey, take a picture and I'll give you an idea what it is. We're not that sophisticated, mm -hmm. but, you know, we'll basically say, here's little thumbnail pictures um, and categorized by shrub, grass, tree, fish, whatever. You know it's a fish or you know it's a tree, not a grass. Then you have a smaller list to look at and you just sort of thumb through it and make a guess. Same thing as I mentioned for iNaturalist though. I mean, so I'm the verifier for New Jersey. So anything that comes in through Ed Maps in New Jersey, I'll get an email and you have to take a picture and I'll say, yes, that is what you said it was. Or I don't think it's this thing. I think it's this other thing. All good. We're all good here. So, you know, you could use Ed Maps to record. It immediately goes into our database and we use that information to make decisions in the future. How common is this thing? Oh, I didn't know this species was now in Camden County. I had no idea. There was no records until someone from Camden County submitted it. And that would be for reporting? or For reporting. Yeah. Yeah. And it's pretty straightforward. Take a picture, make your best guess. Mm -hmm. And we have one layer that's different than the other states where we say, give me an idea of how much there is. One, two to 10, 11 to 100, 100 to 1,000, greater. And so simple. Like you're not meant to like one, two, wait, was it 11 or was it nine? I don't care. Two, tell me one of the categories. <laughs> you know, at least I know there's not a thousand. Um, so yeah, that, that's the only extra bit we ask is if you could give a very rough estimate of how many individuals there are. Because I'm in the science office here and I've seen, you know, come across Brandon Barberries and the old Wharton or Brandon Barberry. Yeah, that's so, great. That's because, you know, we, like I said, we, and especially someone who doesn't spend a lot of time in the Pine Barrens, I have this <clears throat> belief that there's no problem. Right. Well, if there's information collected over time, it'll start to become obvious if there's a problem or a pattern. Like, you know, you might randomly find 10 different invasives, one in 10 different places. But over time, if you and, and, and other people are doing the same thing, it's like, that's funny. That species seems to keep coming up over and over again. Yeah. Now I know that that's more likely to be a problem. Um, and it is just like any other crowdsource thing. The more people that are providing information, the better. You're going to see more around old foundations and stuff like that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because of the uh, concrete. That's fine. Yeah, yeah right. The look, yeah. But it, yeah. it would pretty much just stay kind of close to that area. Yeah. Not spread. Yeah. And and to me, like the database, as long as civilization holds together, <laughs> you know, keeps being built over time. So something, some pattern that I will never see in my lifetime. 50 years from now, someone will see the pattern because of what happened in that intervening 50 years. And, and that's what, you know, one of the things that's killed stewardship and ecology generally is the lack of long-term databases. And, um, you know, if there were more interest in invasives in 1970, you would have seen, if you, and you have doing what we're doing now, you would have seen year by year by year, and someone would have been able to pick up on it much sooner than, like looking back at the last 50 years, like, holy crap, what happened here? <laughs> you know, so same thing moving forward. You know, what are the things, what, what sleepers are starting to pop up in our natural areas? Um, the only way we could find that is if we have a lot of eyeballs reporting somewhere that's centrally recorded, that it's not just, not just the purview of the strike team to look at, these are public databases. Anyone could look at them for any reason any interested person in the public, a researcher 30 years from now, whatever the case may be. Um, but having a, a long-term database is just golden for trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Um, and if there's, if there's interest, that early detection rapid response should be the response, <laughs> a response, a rapid response to someone saying, oh crap, that plant that looks good in the landscape turns out it can do really well in the core of the Pine Barrens. <laughs> you know, we'd rather know that when the first 10, 15, 20 observations are made than after there's 3,000 of them. So, yeah.
Yeah, it's it's absolutely worth recording everything everywhere because that's what's going to help us act now and help people in the future um, understand what happened and act in the future as well. Awesome. Yeah, it's like you said, the more eyes you have, the kid, you can't be everywhere at one time. So. Yeah, I, I, the, the story for the strike team is I, I would not give up on Lyndon Verbarnum. I had only seen it. I, I spent a lot of time in the woods. I had only seen one really bad infestation, and I was convinced it was an emerging invasive species. About three, four, five years into the strike team, half of our 3,000 records were Lyndon Viburnum from all around the state because people started reporting it from everywhere. And it was just like, I couldn't give up. I was so stubborn. But eventually we had to call it widespread. You know, so it, as much as I'm into this and think about this, I was unawares until a whole bunch of people started saying, yeah, it's here too. It's there too. It's that. There was, there was like 1,500 of the first 3,000 observations in the strike team database it was Lyndon Viburnum. Clearly, it's not a virgin. Clearly, it's widespread. But it takes all those eyes to sort of make that um, obvious to everyone, even someone being stubborn about it like I was. All right. Well, uh, I want to thank you, Mike. That was a great uh, presentation. Uh, I'm going to shut down the live stream or the uh, the uh, show there. And uh, I just want to say, uh, coming up, we're going to take off December because it's a busy month. And we'll be back with another presentation uh, for the Pineland Speaker Series in January of 2023. Uh, everybody have happy holidays, and we'll catch you next year. Um, also, keep in mind, uh, our next real big event is going to be the uh, 2023 Pineland Short Course which is going to be down at Stockton University. And the date for that is going to be Saturday, March 11th. Uh, so the Pineland Short Course for 2023 is going to be Saturday, March 11th, down at Stockton. Uh, look forward to the course lineup coming out around the first year. Thank you, and have a great day. Anyone wants to